right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship here today at Conyers First Methodist. It's good to see your faces out there, even though the lights are a bit bright, so and with your masks, it is a bit hard to see your faces, but we're glad you're here. Thanks for worshiping with us today. It's Super Bowl Sunday, so uh, any Bengals fans out there? Any Rams fans out there? Uh, Y'all are cheering for Matthew Stafford, I can tell. Okay, good. Yep, we're glad. Glad uh, for that. As we prepare to get started this morning, just to take time to check out what's been going on. Uh, We're looking forward to launching small groups uh, in the next couple of weeks, so we hope you'll consider prayerfully signing up for one of those. Uh, Another thing, uh, Antonio, our new uh, youth uh, pastor, youth leader, uh, we want to have a welcome for him, so that will be February 27th following the 11 o'clock service in here, so uh, be sure to uh, welcome him again with that. Uh, Leadership board next Sunday. And uh, also Mops gets back into the swing of things this week. So uh, Tuesday morning, uh, we encourage you to invite your friends that are young moms of preschoolers to Mops. So all that's going on. And then confirmation class as well. And I may say a little bit more about confirmation class in a minute, but we'll get that started up uh, probably February 28th on Monday afternoons is what it's looking like. So if you know of any... Any uh, junior high or senior high youth that haven't been through confirmation, please let me know. We'd love to have them be a part of that class. All right, at this time, let's uh, prepare our hearts to worship together by going before the throne of grace and the love of our Lord Jesus in prayer. Father, it's good to be together today. It's good to be with you in your house. It's It's good to seek the heart of Jesus together and to welcome the power of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives in this place. Lord, we come from stressful weeks. We come from uh, burdens on our shoulders and guilt in our heart. And Lord, uh, we pray this would be a day of rejoicing, a day of laying down those broken places in our hearts and lives, a day of trusting you to bring healing and hope and love. So Holy Spirit, let the Spirit of Jesus come be at work in our midst today as we celebrate together, as we sing together, as we seek you together in your best, in Jesus' name. Amen. And please stand. Let's worship the Lord together this morning. Hallelujah. Bless God this morning. Good morning, everybody. If you are joining us online, welcome, welcome. Wherever you may be, join us as we go to the throne of grace and give God praise and worship. Oh, oh, oh. 
I search the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise Treasures that fade Are never enough And you came along And put me back together And every desire Is now satisfied Here in your love Oh there's nothing Better than you, oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you I'm not afraid Show you my weakness My failures and flaws Lord, you've seen them all And you still call me friend The God of the mountain God of the valley There's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me again Oh, there's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing Better than you Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you Oh, there's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing Nothing is better than you You turn morning to dancing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn morning to dancing You give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one you're the only one who cares. You're the only one who cares. You're the only one who cares. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Nothing is better than you You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into army You turn shame into glory 
You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh Lord, there is nothing better than you. You are great. You are good. We thank you that your love surrounds us and fills us and sustains us. And we cling to you today. We join with you and we walk with you. And we thank you that we're not alone, but you're with us too. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. See you guys. Good job. Let's give a hand clap of praise for our guys today. Good job. Way to go. It's good to be with you this week. Um, let's see, today is actually also Scout Sunday. Uh, any Scouts out there? I guess they mainly will be coming at 11, but we did open it up and try to encourage the families to come check us out here too. So if you see some Scouts around, tell them hello and uh, welcome them here. I think they'll be giving away free cobbler or something uh, after the 11 o'clock service. And they'll also be doing a little fundraising. You can get a little card from them that uh, you can use at various uh, places around town for like 10 bucks or something. So, so if you uh, feel called to, seek them out and ask how you can get the, the coupon deals from them. Uh, again, I want to say thank you for continuing to wear your masks. 95% uh, of Georgia is still in the red, and that includes us. I hope it's only going to be another week or two, so I, I hope we're at the tail end and we can get rid of the masks for a while soon, but uh, thank you guys for wearing them just a little while longer uh, till we can get in kind of in that orange range at least, and uh, hopefully that gets us to a place where we won't have to wear masks for a good long while, um, hopefully longer than that, but uh, we're trusting the Lord for that. With our prayer time today, we continue to... Uh, pray for Tom Christian and, and lift him up. Uh, we continue as well to pray for Bob Astalos. And, uh, and he continues to get better. Lynn just told me that he's hoping maybe in a couple of days they'll be, he'll be able to put some weight on his broken leg for the first time in, gosh, a month and a half, two months. So, uh, so I know he's excited by that. So keep him in your prayers. Any other prayer requests or praises? I know we continue to lift up uh, the situation in Ukraine and Russia, and that seems to continue to move toward uh, a bad direction. So let's pray that the Lord might intervene there as well. But if you'll join me, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you again that there's nothing better than you and that uh, you take us as we are with our mess, with our frustrations, with our brokenness. And Lord, you seek to put us together in ways that heal, in ways that forgive, in ways that restore, in ways that help us believe both in you and in who you call us to be. So Lord, help us step into that new place today at the beginning of this week. Lord, by the power of your Spirit, help mend and heal relationships in our lives that maybe are a little bit rocky at the moment. Help go before us in our community and help us continue to work together uh, to be the best we can be here in Rockdale County. By the power of your spirit, heal the sick in our midst. We lift up Tom Christian and his cancer, and uh, we just pray for healing and victory as he journeys through this. And Lord, we give thanks for the healing in Bob's uh, broken bones and in life and continue to pray for your continued blessing for him and his family as well. And just others that are on our hearts or in our minds or on our prayer list, we lift up to you and place in your loving grip and trust that you'll be at work. And then, Father God, we pray uh, that uh, you'll comfort those who are grieving, you'll bless those in our community who are struggling, that you'll help uh, just do a work of your spirit here in our community to strengthen us, to lead us and guide us in your glory. Not just in our community, but in our state and nation, that your love and grace would be at work there. Uh, Lord, that you would 
be a blessing. Uh, bring us together with a spirit of renewal and a spirit of revival and a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of guidance to help us anchor our lives close to you as our loving Heavenly Father. And Lord Jesus, I pray that your good news and your glory might shine forth to the far reaches of our planet and to the very ends of the earth. That, Lord, those who woke up this morning and have no idea who you are, or who Jesus is, or who the Holy Spirit is, Lord, that those people, wherever they are, whatever tribe, language, and tongue, Lord, that you would give us a heart to reach out to them, to love them, to share good news with them, and help them encounter the amazing, transforming grace of Jesus Christ. Father God, I pray as well just for this situation with Ukraine and Russia. Ukraine longs for freedom and democracy. And Russia is inching closer to wanting to take that over. So we just place that situation before you. We pray for the continued diplomacy. We pray that you'd work behind the scenes. We pray that there would be other avenues, peaceful avenues, that could accomplish... Uh, God's best. So we place that before your grace. And we pray your sovereign grace will go with us today as we pray together the prayer Jesus, you've taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those to trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, glory, forever. Amen. All right. It's good to be back with everybody this Sunday. It's good to look to the Lord together. And uh, it's good to be with you. It's uh, Today's February 3rd. 13th, which is Super Bowl Sunday, like we said. And uh, have we found any Bengals fans? Have y'all come in late? Any Bengals fans at all? No, everybody's cheering for the Rams or just... Okay, just to be contrary, there you go. Uh, or you're just looking forward to the commercials or maybe the halftime show, something like that. So, uh, But tomorrow is, is uh, Valentine's Day. And so this morning I want to kind of take a little detour from uh, our parenting series and just talk about a, a, a little different aspect of relationships. You know, uh, Valentine's Day is a day uh, where we lift up romance, where we lift up love, where we lift up all those uh, in neat and ooey-gooey and awesome kind of relationship feelings. And so today, uh, I want us to look a little closer at... Uh, romantic relationships in particular and how God's view uh, of how we relate to each other takes a very different track from the world. You know, when I think about how the world tries to sort of model this kind of thing, you know, uh, I think of the TV shows like uh, Sex in the City, right? Or, uh, you know, Two and a Half Men or The Office or, uh, gosh, the even Big Bang Theory that was on for so long. So often in those shows, you know, uh, it's like they use sexual intimacy as a tension getter to create these love triangles and create tension in the show. And, you know, they kind of do all this stuff. And if someone's being kind of real responsible, you know, maybe they'll wait for the third or fourth date before they get intimate with whoever they're dating. And, and that's just kind of how the world frames romantic relationships these days that uh, you know it, it's really nothing to hop into bed with somebody you barely know and uh, and as we look to the scripture today I think we see a very different model uh, from God and the Lord Jesus and so I want us to take a deep look at that today and so we're going to look at a very romantic passage of scripture in fact the first romance of the Bible that's Genesis chapter 2. And so as we look together, um, here's what uh, the writer of Genesis shares with us. 
starting in the 18th verse, we look at Adam alone. This is what it said. For the, for the Lord God said, it is not good for Adam, the man, to be alone. And so, you know what? I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave the names to all the livestock and the birds of the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And then the Lord God made the woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And Adam, the man said, Now this, this is now bone of my bone. This is flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And so that is why a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. And so Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. This is the word of God for you and me, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Come, Heavenly Father. Come, Holy Spirit. Bless us as we look to your word together today. May it shape our heart, mind, and lives in ways that uh, help us walk through life with your best. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll be with us in this journey. The Holy Spirit, help in Christ's name. Amen. Now, there's a couple of things that I love about this story. The first is just that very first line, where as the father looks at Adam, looks at everything he's made, he comes to this quick conclusion. You know what? It is not good that Adam is alone. That's not a good thing. And out of the gate, uh, God knows that he has designed us as human beings for relationships. We're not designed to be alone. We're not designed to be on our own. We're designed to have companionship. Companionship, uh, one way that we talk about today is marriage. But uh, it, you can also have companionship in singleness and uh, in that avenue as well, through friendships. And so in the story, we see Adam take this journey of naming all the animals. And uh, you can kind of hear this uh, silence in the background. No, that's not going to fit. No, that's not going to work. No, not this one. No, not that one. You know, even the beloved hound dog, right? You know, Adam probably says, oh, you know, yeah, I like you, but I don't think so. And finally, it's like God brings Adam to this conclusion. With everything you've named, um, there ought to be something more. And so Adam falls into the sleep, and God takes part of his side and shapes Eve into a helper suitable for him. Now, this word helper, I want you to understand, it's a word that's used, gosh, about 25 times in the Old Testament. And about 21 of those times, it refers to God as being our helper, right? Right? So, so, ladies, there is no dishonor in, in being called Adam's helper, right? Because uh, they're basically equating your role with God's role in our lives. So, uh, so Eve is given this incredible value and, and brought before the man. And, uh, and Adam, you can just, can you hear the romance in Adam's voice? Can you hear the longing? Can you hear the desire and the appreciation as he just shares those words? Now this, this is what I was waiting for. This is bone of my bone. This is flesh of my flesh. She's like me. We fit. And so she will be called Isha. That's the Hebrew word. She shall be called Isha. For she was taken out of each. 
confused. And so, and so God says this, and Adam says this, and then we get to the concluding verse. This is why it should be normal for men to leave mom and dad and be united to their wife, and the two become one flesh. And what I want to share with you today is, is how different a picture of romantic relationships this is from everything else we see on the outside, from everything else we see in media, from everything else we see on the internet, from everything else for, for probably how 80% of our world does relationships. Um, this is a different kind of deal. And the early church fathers saw these verses as prophetic that these are the words of the living God. And part of God in his DNA, part of God's heart, is that family is one of the basic, essential components to healthy human existence. Family is one of the basic, essential components of healthy human existence. And so right here in the garden, before the fall, before sin, before any other institutions, no government, no hospitals, no churches, none of that stuff. At the heart of the creative process of the universe, there was family. And I think we see in this picture that, that uh, this is it's, it's God's ideal. It's God's ideal for, uh, for a loving relationship. It's God's ideal for raising children. In a, in a healthy uh, marriage environment where they can experience both the, the, the love of a father, kind of modeling, hopefully, healthy fatherhood and healthy uh, maleness to the kids, and where mom, as well, models healthy femaleness to both the kids. Uh, there's nothing quite like it. And, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to downplay. And, you know, in our nation today, you know, we, we kind of have this cultural model where we, where we don't want anyone to feel bad. And, and so we, you know, we embrace all kinds of family. And, and there's not a whole lot really wrong with that, I don't guess. Uh, because if you look at Scripture, while God holds up sort of the traditional family as the ideal, uh, the Lord also... Uh, is acknowledges that in real life, that's not always how it works, right? And if you look in the Old Testament, for instance, uh, God had a huge heart for the widows and for the fatherless. He had a huge heart for the widows and the fatherless. He had a huge heart for the orphan. He had a heart for those who, who managed to grow up and become adults and successful adults. Uh, without the ideal as a part of their life. And so God reminds his people over and over again, you know, have a huge heart for those that have grown up with a dad that's died or a divorce situation or a single mom or a single dad or, or just, you know, growing up with grandparents, whatever it is, uh, God has a heart for you if that's been your journey. And, and God's brought a lot of incredible people out of that kind of journey. You know, Dr. Charles Stanley who's been on TV for years as you know, the preacher at First Baptist Atlanta, grew up with a, as a, you know, with a single mom, raised him. No dad in the home. Uh, but still, I think this is God's ideal. Not only because of what it says in Genesis, but because if we look at Jesus as well, when Jesus gets asked a question about marriage and divorce and all those kind of dynamics, this is the verse he goes back to. And he says, this is God's standard. And so in all those areas, in all those ways, um, you know, I want to encourage you uh, to think through romantic relationships, especially our younger folks, our teenagers, are, uh, who are still trying to figure out how to date and what that looks like, our young adults, so the, maybe folks that are still kind of in the single uh, path of life, you know, um, 
my encouragement for you that I, I think is scripturally based is if you're dating someone and in that journey, I think what scripture recommends wholeheartedly is focus on the relationship with this person that you have. Focus on the friendship part of the relationship rather than the physical part of the relationship. Because let me tell you this, if you find your best friend in the world and the Holy Spirit tells you you can marry this person, then, then you're on a good path, right? But oftentimes it's hard to figure out who this person is if you get so involved physically that, uh, that you kind of miss out on some of those other things. Uh, because the, I just, I'm a big believer that the physical side of relationships, sort of everything focuses on that, and then we forget about, is this a good person? Is this my best friend? Is this someone I can see spending the next 50, 60 years living with? You know, all those things um, are essential components. And so that would be kind of my advice for younger people. Because the model here is this model of leaving mom and dad of cleaving to your spouse and the two becoming one flesh. And, and let's look as well. Jesus talks about this too. And so in Matthew chapter 19, picking up in the third verse, some Pharisees want to kind of check Jesus out and get his thoughts on marriage. And so they ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? because that was very much the practice, especially men could kind of divorce for any reason at all. And so Jesus replies, listen guys, haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? And he said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become, not may become, not might become, not only in certain circumstances become, but the two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two but one flesh, Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Well, why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, well, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. It was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to them, said to Jesus, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, then maybe it's better not to get married. And Jesus goes on and shares, yeah, actually singleness is not a bad idea, especially singleness for the kingdom's sake. Um, and so as, as Jesus lifts this up, the thing I want to, to note is Jesus says the same thing. Jesus says, listen, haven't you heard this verse this verse is from the heart of God's design for human beings. And this verse says that, that kids eventually should grow up and leave mom and dad. And, and for parents of young adults who are maybe considering getting married and those sorts of things, the mom and dad, one of the keys that we can help them in their uh, building of family is to kind of stay out of their way. Because a lot of times young families will have issues if mom and dad hover too much, right? There is a, a healthy principle here that kids are to be launched out and they have to create a new relationship, a new environment, a new family, and they've got to kind of figure that out themselves because they're bringing their, your family into that relationship and the other person's bringing that family into the relationship, right? And so they've got to navigate and make something new. I remember when Andrea and I, uh, we were first married, you know, for us, it... it occasionally would show up in cooking, right? Because we'd have pizza night. And so Andrew would say, okay, what, what do we want with our pizza? And I'm like, how about some corn? It's like, corn? Why in the heck would you want corn with pizza? Well, I don't know. At school, I have corn with pizza. And at home, I've had corn with pizza, right? And she's like, well, that doesn't go with pizza at all. That's just another starch. Instead, let's have salad with pizza. You know, and so for the last you know, almost 30 years, we've been eating salad with our pizza, right? It's those little things where, where uh, mom and dad, one of the keys you have to help your kids have successful relationships 
is by getting out of the way and letting them go. Because if you interfere too much, uh, it can harm their ability to form this new creation. And it is a new creation. I, I'll read for you. Uh, C.S. Lewis, what a great mind and heart he had. He talks about these particular verses and about marriage. And, and here's what he shares about it. The Christian idea of marriage is based on Christ's words that a man and wife are to be regarded as a single organism. For that is what the words one flesh would be in modern English. And so the Christians believe that when he said this, he was not expressing a sentiment, but stating a fact. Just as one is stating a fact when one says that a lock and key are one mechanism, or that a violin and bow are one musical instrument. The inventor of the human machine was telling us that its two halves, the male and female, were made to be combined together in pairs, not simply on the sexual level, but totally combined. The monstrosity of sexual intercourse outside of marriage is that those who indulge in it are trying to isolate one kind of union, that's the sexual piece, from all the other kinds of union which were intended to go along with it. That is the covenant relationship, the love, the commitment, the forgiveness, all that, all that, all that other stuff. The Christian attitude does not mean that there is anything wrong with sexual pleasure any more than about the pleasure of eating, but it means that you must not isolate that pleasure and try to get it by itself any more than you ought to try getting the pleasure of taste without swallowing and digesting by chewing things and spitting them out again. And, uh, and so th this is kind of the deal. That, as I said, it's just incredibly countercultural. The idea that in human relationships um, we're made to be bonded into something new, something different than we were individually, something different than we were before. And so in modern culture where you see these hookups and where you see this one night stands and you see all the other stuff that's kind of encouraged in modern culture, what you're seeing is people being encouraged to sort of come together and tear apart and come together and tear apart and come together and tear apart. And oftentimes, I think what that leads to is, a, is a, a good bit of pain, especially when you're in a bad relationship. I think it, what it equates to is an awful lot of hurt, an awful lot of wounding. It may, make, it may make it harder when you do find the one and only person that, that you say, this is my best friend, I want to be with them the rest of my life. That may, it may make it harder to build that trust that, well, you've been with these other half a dozen people or whatever, but now you're going to be with me only. You know, all those dynamics. Uh, and that doesn't even include the challenge of disease. That doesn't even include the challenge of unplanned pregnancies and all the other things that can kind of happen along the way. And so, uh, so the Lord says, you know, um, there's a component here that this is a binding kind of deal, a beautiful thing, a sacred thing. But just, just be careful making it cheap. It's never meant to be cheap. And so that's one of the pieces. And then Jesus, of course, brings up the other piece that's so countercultural to our day, and that, that's the whole thing with divorce, right? Um, you know, he basically says, you know, from the beginning, before there was sin, before there was selfishness, before we each wanted our own deal, um, Divorce wasn't in the plan. It just, it wasn't. Um, divorce is something that Moses added on to the law as a concession. Because we have hard hearts, and we have a hard time getting along with each other. And sometimes we feel like it's easier to run than it is to stay. And, and marriage, you know, I don't, uh, don't want to make marriage sound, you know, oftentimes we think of marriage like, when we're young, maybe, like Cinderella, right? I found the right person, and now we'll get married, and everything will be glorious, and we'll live happily ever after. The, the problem with the happily ever after is what? It, it doesn't remind us that, that we've got a lot of work to do to get there, right? And marriage is work. And marriage takes both of us, doesn't it? It takes two people working on the relationship. It takes two people willing to forgive. It takes two people willing to surrender and, and try to help the other person 
it takes two people that stick at it through thick and thin. And, and our culture really isn't used to that today. You know, I think we just kind of say, well, I don't really love this person anymore, so I'll leave. You know, and then maybe you find somebody else, you get married to them. But statistics I saw show that the more people get married over and over again, the less likely it is often to work. And, and that's not to, again, oh, this isn't about making you feel guilty or making you feel bad. I know people have been through divorce, and that's part of the challenge of it, isn't it, is that one person can say, I'm committed, this is for a lifetime, and I'm going to do my best to be faithful to this relationship no matter what and to work at it no matter what. And the other person can come to a place to say, I don't really care anymore. I'm out of here. Goodbye. You know, and so I realize a, a, a lot of divorce, if you're in that situation with one person trying and another person giving up, I mean, divorce is going to happen. Uh, you know, like what Moses said. Uh, in that case, then it's going to happen. In some cases where there's, where a marriage is completely unhealthy, where there's physical abuse or other kinds of abuse going on, I mean, those are other situations that, that at least separation, uh, but very likely divorce may, may be still the best option. Um, but with all these questions, Jesus, again, holds up this ideal of how important these relationships are. And, uh, and how we're called to love one another in and through them. Uh, because, uh, because we're not made to go through the pain and brokenness that they cause us, that they cause children, and on down the line. Again, C.S. Lewis talks a little bit about this divorce kind of deal. He says this, uh, I mean that all churches regard divorce as something like cutting up a living body as a kind of surgical operation. Some of them think the operation is so violent that it cannot be done at all. Other churches admit that it is a desperate remedy in extreme cases, but they're all agreed that divorce is more like having both your legs cut off than like, ha than like dissolving a business partnership or even deserting a regiment of troops. And, uh, and, and so kind of that visualization, seeing divorce as cutting off your legs. I mean, that's, that's pretty severe. Um, but I think there's truth there. And so my hope today is that, uh, that somehow we could be different. And we could realize that being different, um, again, it's not about guilt. Or, you know, we get accused of thinking, you know, that uh, we just we think sex is bad or evil or something like that. And that's not the case at all. Sex is beautiful. Intimacy is beautiful. It's good. It's appropriate in the marriage context. That's what it was made for and designed for. And that's where it's expressed the best uh, in a healthy way. And so uh, I encourage you with that today. And the last thing I'll say about this is a comment Paul makes because uh, the picture of marriage, is finally also, it's a picture of our relationship with God and our relationship with Jesus. Paul picks up on this on Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, he says, Listen, I tell you a profound mystery. The mystery is, I'm talking about Christ and the church, but however, each one of you, uh, let, me, let me say that again. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, the two will become one flesh, then Paul says, this is a profound mystery, but I am talking about between Christ and the church. And so what Paul equates here is that the, the picture of marriage is also a picture of us together and our relationship with Jesus. We are in an intimate relationship with Jesus. We are his hands and feet. We are his heart, his mind, his eyes, his ears. We're, we are to be his fully on earth, and, and that is to be a mystery, and that is to be amazing, and that is to be incredible as well. And, uh, and so um, one of the ways I hope today is that you'll learn in this to see how close God loves you in your relationship to Jesus. All right, I want to share two things. 
and they're, I've kind of gotten them out of order. But the first is, as I said, marriage isn't always easy, but it's worth fighting for. I think one of the great songs that shares that is a song by Casting Crown called Broken Together. Have you heard that on the radio? It's a really, really neat song, and it's a song about how as selfish human beings we get in each other's way so much that there's something about not giving up this bond that God has given us. And so this is how it goes. What do you think about when you look at me? I know we're not the fairy tale you dreamed we'd be. You did wear the veil, you walked the aisle, you took my hand, and we dove into a mystery. I wish we could go back to simpler times before all our scars and all our secrets were in the light. But now on this hallowed ground, we've drawn the battle line. So will we make it through the night? It's going to take much more than promises this time. Only God can change our mind. Maybe you and I were never meant to be together. Oh, excuse me. Maybe you and I were never meant to be complete but could we just be broken together? If you can bring your shattered dreams, and I'll bring mine, could healing still be spoken and save us? The only way we'll last forever is broken together. How it must have been so lonely by my side. We were building kingdoms and chasing dreams and left love behind. I'm praying God will help our broken hearts align and we won't give up the fight. It's going to take much more than promises this time, but only God can change our minds. Maybe you and I were never meant to be complete, but could we just be broken together? If you can bring your shattered dreams and I'll bring mine, could healing still be spoken and save us? Because the only way will last forever is broken together. Um, you know, I think that's a beautiful picture. It's not easy. Marriage isn't necessarily an easy thing, but it can be a beautiful thing, right? When we're vulnerable enough, when we love one another enough, when we forgive one another enough to be broken together. I, the, some of the wisest words I've ever heard, I think, were said by James Dobson, maybe. And James Dobson said, before you get married, keep your eyes wide open. Is this the one? And then after you get married, keep them half closed. After you get married, keep them half closed. So that you can let go of the stuff when two broken people are trying to work together. And, uh, and so, in conclusion, I want to share one more little little thing, and, and this is how Valentine's Day not only is about romance, uh, but may Valentine's Day be a reminder of your relationship to Jesus. This last little word comes from Kamran Yareli, and Kamran is a former Muslim who found Jesus and has some neat little in interesting insights onto this. And this is what he says, have you ever been in love? There is something about looking at someone for the first time and feeling love and passion for them. The way we look at each other is so full of fire. Our faces are radiant. I remember the way my wife looked at me when we first met. It was so fulfilling, and I miss that, and I know she misses that too. So do you remember the first time you met Jesus Christ? When we gave our hearts to him, we felt so much passion toward him, and we looked at him with so much love. Is it possible that he enjoyed our love, passion, the way we looked at him? I personally believe that he enjoys the way we look at him. So are we looking at him the way we used to? Is he thirsty for our passionate looks? Absolutely. What can we do to get back to that place? So ask him to stir your heart, to look at him like you did when you first met. Look at him in your heart every day like you just met him, and for the first time, because he is God and will re reveal himself every day in a new way. Tell him every single day that you're glad you met him. Think of new thoughts toward him every single day. Worship him like you've just discovered him and have been discovered by him. 
Tell him things you've never told him before. Walk with him the way you never walked before. Touch him like you've never touched him before. Be so honest with him like you have never been before. Tap into your true feelings for him and meditate on them. Look at Jesus for the first time again today. So whether it's someone you love or whether it's Jesus, have a wonderful afternoon of Super Bowl and a good Valentine's tomorrow. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray. Father God, I I, uh, pray today that you would help us um, come to believe that you really want our best. It's not an easy path. It's a bit of a hard path and a holy path. But uh, but it's a path that can help us find our way in this crazy, mixed-up world. And so, Lord, help us in our romantic relationships, uh, whether it's a first date or a tenth date or two years together or 50 years together. Help us love you and love one another. And help us love you like the first time we met you. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand and let's offer our hearts out of love for the Lord today and what he is doing and has done.
opened up my heart to you. I opened up my heart to you now. Do only you can. Jesus, have your way with me now. All I want is to live within your love, be undone by who you are. My desire is to know you deeper, Lord. I will open up again, throw my fears into the wind. I am desperate for the touch of heaven, oh. Oh, 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 Thanks for being with us today. We pray a blessing in your life and all you do and all what you do. Y'all, I know in this message, I kind of have left out a component that's a big part of our culture today. It's a part of sort of the infighting in the Methodist church today. Um, I think there's enough that I've shared that'll keep us wrestling for a while. So, so I didn't touch on that there. I probably, well, I'm planning to do sort of more of small group Bible study, maybe toward the fall where we'll look at sort of that other component from a loving and fair uh, and biblical perspective and kind of wrestle with all those issues too. Uh, But for today, uh, may this challenge us enough. On this Valentine's Day, may you go in a father's love who's made you. He's woven the inside of who you are. He knows you better than anybody else. He knows what helps us pick the best. And so let him guide you. Uh, let Jesus be our elder brother here to shape our heart and life and to bless our relationships with those closest to us. And go in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit help be your grace, your mercy, your love and truth on those you love nearest and best. All your days, now and forever. Amen and have a great week. can do.